<laughs> Hallelujah. Revelations 5.1. Revelations 5.1. If you would turn there with me. The message that the Lord gave me is weep not. Behold the Lion of Judah. Weep not, church. Behold the Lion of Judah. Well not. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. You don't have to weep today. We are going to get a fresh vision today. God, give us a fresh vision of what you have done and what we have in you. Do you know the plan of the enemy is to distort what you have in Christ. And to get you to believe that there is no victory in this specific area in your life. Or your struggle or your battle or your sorrow or the pain that has been there for so long. Or your sickness. The enemy wants to distort the plan of God. But the plan of God from the beginning has always been to redeem you and to set you free. And I'm not just talking about when we get to glory. I'm talking about right here and now. That you can walk in a spirit of triumph. You can walk in a spirit of victory this morning. You don't have to walk with your head hanging down any longer. You can lift up your hands to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he shall lift you up. He shall lift you up. Does that mean that that circumstance is going to dissipate before your eyes? Probably not. But there's a victory by the spirit that lives in you. God himself who created heaven and earth lives inside of you. And he has given you the victory. Hallelujah. Revelations 5.1 And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written. Within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor on earth nor under the earth was able to open the book. Neither to look thereon. And I wept much. Because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The thrust of my message this morning is this. Weep not, behold the Lion of Judah. There's an atmosphere of faith and victory that God wants to continuously draw us into and operate here and now. Listen, church. God has sent his son to die to cause us to walk this life in victory every single day of our lives, not just when we get to glory. And he is worthy. He is worthy. And I want to say this. John wrote this book. The apostle, the beloved John, the one who rested his head on Jesus's breast. He wrote this book when he was sent to the island of Patmos. He was in a place where he was sent and exiled away for preaching and living the gospel. See, have you ever felt rejected by other people? Have you ever felt alone and like no one understands you? Well, God himself allowed John to be separated for a season to be revealed so God could reveal himself to John in such a way that he had never done to anybody else. He had never revealed the truth of what was to come to anyone else but to John. And listen, if you feel like that right now, God doesn't want to just unveil and uncover his treasure to John or to Paul or to any of the disciples. He wants to uncover his treasure to you. Amen. He wants to unveil his truth to you. And John, he wrote this book, he wrote Revelations, he wrote John, and he wrote three of the epistles. 
but he was under persecution at the time. And why did he write this book? He wrote this book to prepare and strengthen Christians in Asia Minor at this time. There were seven different churches, and he was encouraging them to remain faithful against the impeding persecution that was coming. Now the enemy has come to rob, to kill, and to destroy. And, the, and God himself not only has written to those in Asia Minor, but he wants you to know. He wants the church today to know. Remain faithful against what is coming against you. It could be your own internal struggle. It could be the enemy without. It could be other people. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers of darkness and wicked rulers of the air. See, the enemy is trying to get Christ in you. That you would lose faith in the victory and the triumph that the Lion of Judah has already won for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Victory is yours this morning. Church, remain faithful. Amen. If your children won't, you remain faithful. If your spouse won't, you remain faithful. Yeah. If your mother or father won't, you remain faithful. You remain faithful because when you do, Jesus working in you through you can be a demonstration of his spirit to them. And they won't be able to deny the power of God that is in your life. That is on your life. You remain faithful against the impeding persecution that is coming your way. Hallelujah, Jesus. Revelations 1 1 says this the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you could say this, you could say, Well, Angela, I hear you, but how? How do I stand? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's constant, it's heavy, it's a burden, it's weighted. Well, I'm gonna tell you this morning. Revelations of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Which God gave unto him, unto who? John. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and he signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Re a revelation is the act of disclosing or communicating divine truth to, from God to man. The act of communicating divine truth. From God to man. The act of bringing something into view and making it known, unlight enlightening us. Have y'all ever been driving the car? Jeff and I go through this all the time. When he drives, he has to fix the mirrors and put everything in view. <clears throat> and then I'm short, so I get in the car and I raise it up, it's like <laughs> and then I move it all the way up forward, and then I gotta fix the mirrors and I gotta put things into view. I gotta put things into perspective so that I could drive the car safely. That's good. That's good. Okay? God wants, see, each person individually, yeah. He's yeah. revealing truth and disclosing His treasure to us individually. So maybe I don't have what Pastor Matt has, or Pastor Matt doesn't have what Nye has, or Nye doesn't have what Manuel has, because God is unveiling His truth in the way that He wants to do it for you to speak to you to get to your heart so he wants to put everything in perspective and in view for you and it could be in a different way jeff can't drive the way that i do set up in a car and i can't drive the way that he does but god wants to put everything in perspective or how about when you have the fog fog in a mirror and a fog on the windshield, and then you try to do the like the cool, and it still stays foggy. And then you try to do the hot, and it still stays foggy. So you're just driving, it's not raining with the windshield wiper. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That's just me that doesn't know which button to press at what time. But God wants to wipe away that fog in our life by the Holy Spirit. He wants to keep uncovering truth after truth after truth to you so you don't be discouraged if you don't understand 
Pastor Matt's 10 point sermons. <laughs> or when I take an extra hour. Or you don't understand something that somebody was praying about. Or you don't understand what the teacher talked about. See, because God's going to one day wipe away that fog. And it's going to reveal truth. And you're going to be like, I got it. <laughs> I got it. Wait, I got it. But if you stop, if you quit, if you don't remain faithful, then he's not going to be able to put things in view for you. He's not going to be able to establish truth to reign in your heart so that you can actually stand against the enemy and against things that come against you. So stay faithful to the truth and he will continue to uncover and reveal. And that's what he was doing with John at this time, um, exiled on the island of Patmos with nobody else but the Holy Ghost. Nobody else with, but the Spirit of God communicating divine truth to him. Amen. And that's what the Spirit of God is doing in this day and age. See, we see it in the book of Genesis. Spirit of God moves on the face of the waters. Jeff and I have been talking about this with the Trinity. But we also see it in the book of Revelations, the Spirit of God speaking to the church. But we also see it in the book of John. John 16, 13 says this. How be it when the Spirit of truth is come, what he's come, the Spirit of truth did what? He came. Yeah, he came for you. The spirit of truth came. He will what? Guide you into all truth. Into all truth. You don't feel like you know the truth. The spirit of God has come to guide you into all truth. For he shall know not, speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he shall show you what? Show you things to come. The Spirit of God that lives in you will show you things to come. Yes. He's like a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. As you begin to have a relationship with the Lord, the Spirit of God will begin to uncover truth to you and reveal things to you with spiritual eyes that you have never seen before. Danielle said to me this morning, she said, do you like my new glasses? I said, yeah, girl, I like those glasses. But they put things in perspective for her. They reveal things that another way she wouldn't have been able to see. So when you have a relationship with the Lord, the Spirit of God in you, listen, I know this isn't like we're hanging off the rooftops and shouting message, but I think we need to learn some truth that can be established in our heart so that when things come, the Spirit of God within us, we know how to access the power of God and stand against the tactics of the enemy and actually know their tactics. See, because sometimes we can be getting hit from left to right to left to right. And all of a sudden we're like, what is going on? But the Spirit of God will be that detector to be like, boop, 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 boop. Uh, That's the enemy. Yeah. Amen. That is not Naya. <laughs> <laughs> that is a tactic and a lie of the enemy to distort your view of Christ in the body.
The Spirit of God was there. Hallelujah. And light came into the world. The Spirit of God was exposing darkness and bringing forth light. He was revealing truth in the beginning. And then spoke Jesus unto them. This is John 8, 12, saying, I am the what? The light of the world. So I want you to see the Trinity. Jeff has been preaching to me on this. It's been good. And he said, God created the heaven and the earth. So God was there. The spirit was moving upon the face of the waters. And light broke forth. Yeah. Well, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Yeah. So we can see God there and the spirit there and Jesus all there in the beginning of time. Amen. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follow me shall what? Not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He shall have the light of life. Well, you can say, Angela, okay, I, I'm, I'm following you, but how can the Spirit of God now live in me? From the moment of salvation, Jesus took you, and well, the Holy Spirit took you and placed you where? In Christ. From the moment you got saved, the moment you said yes to Jesus, the Spirit of God said, I'm going to place you in him. I'm going to place you in Christ Jesus. And all that Jesus has is now yours. Everything that he died for is now a benefit. You are a beneficiary of the kingdom and the glory of God. The keys to the kingdom of God are now yours. You are a daughter and a son of God. You are a child of the Most High. You are a child of the King. That is who you are. You are one that can access the Prince of Peace. The comforting of the Holy Spirit. The divine deliverance of the power of God. You can walk in that. You can, you can claim it as yours. It is your inheritance. Well, I don't, okay, I hear you. But God make it known to us. Well, that's what the Spirit of God, when he moves on the inside of you, he's the one that reveals truth yes. to you. He's the one. Well, how does that happen? How's that happen, Angela? Well, he said, after he rose from the grave, 40 days later was the day of Pentecost. Was the day that the Spirit of God was implemented into the new covenant, into the heart of man. Where the Spirit of God now didn't just rest on people, but rested in people. That means if you go to your job, he is there. You go to your house, he is there. He is in your car. He is in the good places that you go and the bad places that you go. He is everywhere that you go because now on the day of Pentecost, he moves inside of man. You have a holy God that lives inside of you. It said in the book of Acts 1-4, and being assembled together with them, I commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to what? Wait. We are not good at waiting, y'all. We're not. We're not. That's why we drive through drive throughs And let me tell you, in the state of Mississippi, they're even just as slow. Just as slow as going into, you might as well go in. But we, but we don't like to wait. And he said, God told him this, look, the promise of the Spirit of God is coming. The promise that I had given you of that breakthrough is coming. The promise of that deliverance and that deliverance for that child is coming. The promise that I had given you is coming. But I need you to remain faithful and wait. I need you to remain faithful with expectancy and wait. I need you to remain faithful so your spouse could see. Wait on his faithfulness. 
that means to tarry, to remain, to dwell there. We don't like to wait. We're distracted. Look, I understand. I, I married Jeff with three kids and have one on the way. And the Lord just took me from, and I'm noticing it more and more. I'm like, man, he took me from one place to the next. And it's harder to wait because you feel like you got to do 600 million things. Yeah. And I mean that. I feel like I got to do 800 million things a day. Get up and go. But the Lord is saying, no, just wait. Wait in my presence. Wait wherever you got to go. You got to get in your car. Wait. You go on the drive to work. Wait in his presence. But waiting takes a focus. It takes a reef and a refocus and a refocus. Get out of line. Well, re Look, if you are driving down the street and your mirrors got out of focus, I pray to God that you would refocus them. So you could actually see what was going on. And that's what the Lord is saying today. Hey, I want you to refocus, church. I want you to weep not. And I want you to behold the victory and the triumph that I have already given you. And I've given it to you because on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God fell. And it said it filled them all. It filled them all. So my spirit that lives in you and dwells in you now is going to teach you to press and to wait and to lay hold of the kingdom and of the glory of God. It's going to teach you truth. It's going to teach you to prevail. It's going to teach you to stay there and hold on to the horns of the altar and not quit yeah. and not go back. Yeah. Going back is not the answer. So we see the promise of the Father when he speaks it. And then we see the fulfillment of the promise. But there was a wait between it. Between the promise and the fulfillment, we see a waiting period. And let me tell you, being pregnant, there's like this incubation period. <laughs> okay. That is uncomfortable. Annoying. <laughs> Tiring, frustrating, demanding. I mean, I'm so, I just went back to Rob. I said, Rob, I could barely breathe. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to preach. I could barely breathe. But you, but isn't that in the process of waiting? You know what I'm talking about, Laura. In the process of waiting, that's how it feels. There's pressure. It takes your breath away. Yeah. It's frustrating. Yeah. But what am I going to do? Mm. I can't quit. Yeah. The baby is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't wait. Because I want my body back. <laughs> <laughs> but God, there's that waiting period. But he was preparing me. As the vessel, and he's preparing the promise. He's preparing Selah. So he's preparing your promise. What he's doing, he's working, but he's preparing you as the vessel that's going to receive the promise that God has given you. So you wait and you prevail and you press. a long time ago. 
I know that I would be dead a long time ago. But the Spirit of God, He doesn't quit. He doesn't quit on you. He's not going to quit reminding you of His truth. He's going to show up in your prayer closet and say, Hey, Wade, you remember that prayer you prayed? Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. He's going to say, Robert, you know how many times you prayed for the lost. We're here. And the revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelations 1, 1 says, which God gave unto him to show him, to reveal a divine truth to him and unto his servants, things that were to come to pass. These things are going to come into existence. They're going to come into view. They're going to show up. You're going to see it with your own eyes. Y'all ready to see God move with your own eyes? Are you ready to see the promise come to pass? Whatever it is for you as an individual, whatever it is for us as a church, whatever it is for you as a family, it is going to come into existence. It's going to come to pass. He promised it. And he said he sent and signified it by an angel unto his servant, John. All things that the Father has given unto Christ is now yours. It's yours. It's yours. It's, 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 it's the, your neighbors, but it's yours. You have to start making this personal. Yes. Start making it personal. God, everything that you died for is now mine. Revelations 1, 2 says this. Who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and all things that he saw. So he was saying this. Look, everything that God reveals to me, I'm going to write down and I'm going to be faithful to write it down as a testimony of what God is showing me. And that's what Pastor Matt told me the other day. He said, Angela, I've been praying and witnessing to people all throughout my work. I don't know if I'm going to get fired or not. And I said, well, just keep preaching, brother. And if you do, then God's going to give you a new thing. Amen. God's going to give you a new thing. But I tell you what, God, that's what he was saying to John. Look, I'm going to show you some things and I want you to write it down as a witness of my power. That's what a testimony is. That's what we're supposed to do as the body of Christ. We're supposed to have him reveal things to us as we begin to walk them out and then tell people about them. Tell people about them. Look what God can do for you. Look what he can do for your family. Look what he can do. You are to be a witness, not just, okay, let me say this, because you can talk a big talk. Right. Amen. But we also need to witness with our walk. Amen. That's right. That does not mean perfection. That means process. Yeah, help us look. Oh, because my process can look real ugly sometimes. So can yours. Okay. I know we ain't got angel wings and halos in here. Not perfection, but process. Yes. And in, but what's beautiful about this is it's real Christianity. It's the process of learning how to walk in victory. Yes. It's a process of learning how to walk in triumph. Yes. It's a process of refocusing. See, before we might have been distracted and discouraged much longer. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And now all of a sudden we can, wait, recognize it. Wait, that's what that is. Let me refocus. Let me realign. Let me get back in his presence. Wait, I missed a couple times sitting with him. My life is looking a mess. I need to get back with him. Yeah. I need yeah. to get back with him. Hold on. Like there's a process. There's a growth. There's a maturity as a child of God that God wants us to grow and mature into. But you don't have to beat yourself up and throw yourself out. That's right. Jesus didn't, he didn't say, let me cut, cut this one out. No, he said, my love never fails. My love never runs dry. The blood of Jesus reaches to the highest mountain and flows to the lowest valleys. The blood of Jesus continues to prevail as long as you continue to have faith. Yeah. You have to continue to prevail in faith. 
Hallelujah. And how do I do that? By the spirit of God that lives in me. He says, Revelations 1, thing, 3. Blessed is he that readeth and that hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. God is saying the time is at hand. The beginning of the fulfillment of the things which you read in this book in Revelations is at hand. And you would be blessed if you read them and you keep them. Hide them in your heart. And don't let the truth of God's word be taken by the enemy or the things of this world that will distort your view of truth and who God is. There is truth that God wants to keep in your heart and social media and gatherings and the news and all these different things come to distort your view of truth. But the word of God is what the truth is. So you stay where? In the word. Shut it off. Turn it off. Get it out. Get in the presence and the word of God and allow the spirit of God to reveal truth to you. He said, blessed are these who read it and keep it. Keep it. Don't let it be stolen from you. So real quick, he says, Revelations 1-4. John, to the seven churches of Asia, grace be unto you and peace from which, listen to this, which him that is and was and is to come. Him that is and was and is to come. Amen. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. He's saying, John, write this to the seven churches. And when you do, he greets them with grace and peace. That's not just a fluffy saying. He's saying, I pray that the divine influence of the power of God be reflected in your heart and in your life. Grace. That's what grace is. Grace is power. Grace is favor on your life. He's saying, John, write to them and pray for them that they have grace. They have God's spirit reflected in and through their lives. And that they would have peace. They would have quietness and rest and wholeness. Have you felt broken? Have things been loud in your mind or in your emotions? He's saying, I will send my spirit to give you divine peace, divine rest. I will set you at one again. I will make you whole again. Peace be unto you personally. At the moment of salvation, I will do this for you. And he said, he who is and was and is to come. He is from the beginning. He was. I found this on the web. I found this on the web. (laughs) Praise God, that's on the web. (laughs) There's something good's in there. He, He is in the beginning. And he was as he walked this earth. And he is to come. Let me tell you, there's going to be a rapture of the church. There's going to be a second coming. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Whether you understand it now or not, he wants to wipe away and unveil some truth to you. Now, depending on when that happens, I will not debate Pastor Matt and Aaron and, and get into the doctrinal debate about when that will happen. But get this. Be prepared for when it happens. Be ready for when it happens. Get ready, church. And that's what he was saying. He said, look, I want you to write this book to my churches because they have some great things about them, but there are some things they need a little bit of work on. Can I get a witness? All right. So we can say as individuals, there were seven different churches he wrote to. Seven different examples of great things they had, strengths, and then weaknesses. And as an individual, there are some amazing qualities, gifts, and talents, and abilities, and things that God has given us, and changed us, and transformed us, and and we we have strengths. But he's saying, but I need you to work on this now. 
I need this to change. I need this to change. I know, I don't know what it is for you that needs to go, but I know what it is for me. Come on now. Yeah. Well, you got work that needs to be done, Angela? Nah. <laughs> no work here. <laughs> God, God wants to do that. And that's what he was saying. He said, look, I'm coming back. And I'm coming for a pure and spotless bride. Now that doesn't mean you got to work it all up. That means you believe. And the spirit of God cleanses and washes and changes. You believe. And in the process as you triumph and overcome. You receive what God's spirit has for you. But he says, I love this. The Spirit of God is so gracious in this chapter. He writes this to say Ephesus. And he says, he encourages them and says, I see your labor. I see your works. I see your patience. I see that you abhor evil. But I have this one thing against you that you have left thy first love. I don't know about you, but if you've been walking with the Lord for some time, it's somewhat easy to get into repetition. Mm -hmm. I go to church. I talk about Jesus. Pay my tithes. I lift my hands. Yeah, I've, I've worked on my patience. My patience has, has prevailed. But what about your heart? Where is your heart? He's saying, and, now I, and I can be one to say, I've been there. It's easy to get into a works-based mentality. I work for God. And it looks good to the natural eye. But is our heart longing for him? Longing for his word, longing for his presence. So he says this, write to this church and tell them these things. And he says, well, how do I fix it? Well, if, if my heart is being separated from my first love, what do I do? Remember, therefore, from whence you have fallen and repent. Church, we still should be a church of repentance. Yes. Listen to me. Repentance will bring you back to Christ, which will bring you back into joy yes. and right relationship with him. Amen. Why am I saying this, Angela? You went, because we not see sin can cause a struggle or a weeping or a wailing or a sorrow within the heart and the mind of a believer. But the, God is saying, hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. You got some great things about you. But I want you to know your heart has been falling away from me. And I need you to remember from whence you have fallen. And I want you to repent, change direction, yes. and yes. run back to me. Yes. Run Go back to loving him yes, again. Hallelujah. Just him. Amen. Not the works of doing for him. Yeah. So you feel important. So I feel important like I did something for God. No, help me to fall back in love with you again. Refocus. Weep not. Don't be stale. I was praying this morning in prayer. God help us to not get so comfortable in just doing for you that we forget to love you. Amen. God help us. Jesus. Jesus. Couple of the other churches he wrote to, Smyrna were under they were under severe persecution. And he said, "Look, well, there's a temptation. There's a temptation that you're under so much pressure that you'll faint." Have you ever been under so much pressure that you've wanted to quit and faint? And he's saying, look, fear, fear none of those things.
but you shall sh suffer. Fear none. Behold, the devil shall be cast into prison. That you may be tried. You're going to be tested, church. And that you shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee the crown of life. I will give thee the crown of life. Listen, he's saying, listen, in the beginning of the book of Revelation, you shall be blessed and the truth shall be revealed to you. And the spirit of God that lives in you is going to cause you to triumph. But I have some things I need to address with you. And I need them to be addressed so that you repent and can triumph. But weep not, church. Behold the lion of Judah. Behold the lion of Judah. Hallelujah. He said to Paraguamos, I know thy works and where thou dwell, even where Satan's seat is. But you hold fast to my name, and you have not denied my faith. He was saying, there is those that are among you that are faithful believers. But Satan has placed his seat in your congregation, even to the place where the pastor was martyred. And the doctrine, listen to this, the doctrine of Balaam was taught, beginning to be taught. What is that? Personal gain, compromise, greed, selfishness. Personal gain, compromise, greed, and selfishness was beginning to be taught in the church. And one that stuck out to me the most there was compromise. Mm -hmm. Allowing a little bit in yeah. and expecting it to not have eternal consequences. Mm -hmm. We can't allow things. Sin, God does not wink at sin. He does not play with it. And if we allow it to take root in our hearts, it will begin to destroy us. Selfishness, that me, 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 me spirit. So he said this, look, I need you to repent. I need you to return. I need, I will do this and I will forgive you and I will not charge you that are guilty. Oh, yes, Jesus. I will, I need you to repent of your selfishness. I need you to repent of your compromise. I need you to permit, per, uh, repent of your greed. And when you do, I will forgive you and you will not be charged guilty. I will forgive you and you will not be charged guilty. Hallelujah. And he goes on and on and on to each church. And he tells them. To repent and to come back to the, their first love. And that they will be overcomers. This I do want to hit this church. The Tyra. He says, I know thy works and thy charity and thy service and thy faith. And thy patience and thy works. And last, more than the first. He was commending them on their faith. But there was a spirit of Jezebel. Of adultery that was in the church. Of idolatry that was in the church. Adultery could be you're cheating on, I'm not, it's you're cheating on your spouse. You're cheating on Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're allowing something into your life that is not of Him and you're cheating on Him. You're committing spiritual adultery or you're putting something before Him which is spiritual idolatry. And He's saying, I see this in the church. You got some great things. But this very thing will kill you. And the, and the pastor, my mom and I were talking about this. The pastor committed the sin of saying nothing. We don't have that problem in this church. Thank you, Pastor Matt. But when you say nothing, it is sin. When you don't address something, it is sin. When you call evil good, it is sin. When you know what to do and don't do it, it is sin. And when you justify it, it is sin. So he's saying, look, what I, what I love about the Lord is he's continuously calling them back to the line of Judah. He's not, he's not saying, 
you got some great things about you, but this got to go, but I don't want nothing to do with you. No, he said, you have some amazing strengths, but this one thing will be your very fall. So repent and return for to the lion of Judah, weep not, well not. Behold, refocus, realign yourself for the kingdom and the glory of God. Get right back with me. Oh, plead the blood of Jesus over that thing. See that thing, I do not condemn you. You are not guilty. You shall not be ashamed. I am not ashamed to be called your God. I want you to remain faithful and true to me and return. Because I'm the Lion of Judah who has given you triumph and victory. I have given you triumph and victory. Well, I've been suffering with this thing for a, for a long time, Angela. He wants to give you triumph and victory. He said to Sardis, be watchful, be awake. Listen, I want y'all to hear this. And strengthen that which remains. That which is ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. He's saying, strengthen that which remains in you to continue to be true to him. Wake up. That's what he said. Be watchful. Wake up and strengthen by my spirit. Steadfastly set yourself up. That which remains because it's getting ready to die. And I want to revive you again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. He said, he that overcometh, Revelations 3, 5. He that overcometh, he that walk in victory. And the same shall be clothed in a white raiment. Hey, you get new clothes. You get a white garment. You get righteous gear on, okay? As they would say with the youth, you get a righteous raiment that clothes you. Listen, I'm, I, I've messed up too much, Angela. I don't know what to do. He said, repent and overcome, and I will clothe you with a righteous raiment with white. Yes. I will wash you. And he said, listen, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Wait, though. That tells me there is not unconditional security. That's right. That's right. Uh -huh. He's telling me that doesn't mean once saved and you're always saved. That's right. He's saying he that overcometh. That's not perfection. Once again, I want to keep saying that. But he that sees his failures and repents yes. and is clothed yes. with the blood of Jesus again in a remnant of righteousness I will not blot out his name but I will confess his name before my father and the angels hallelujah hallelujah Jesus doesn't want to throw us out church he is called, do you hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying this morning? He's not getting rid of you. He's got a plan for you. He's got a purpose for you and for your family. And he's telling you to weep not, to repent, to come back. Come back to him. Come back to where you first believed. Come back to that desperateness. Listen, I don't know about you, but I remember how desperate I was on the day that I got saved. I was desperate. Don't forget your desperateness when he begins to clean you up. Amen. You begin to get a new walk and a new talk. You begin to learn the Christianese and the lingo. You get new friends, church friends, and you get a little money in your pocket like you didn't have before. And you get a little bit of cleaned up, but but then we begin to become haughty and arrogant and prideful in what we know about the things of God. But God is saying, no, 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 that's not what I desire of you. I desire for you to love me. I desire for you to know me. Don't forget the desperateness. 
Don't forget what I pulled you out of. Don't forget the muck and the mire that I kept you through. Don't forget the family struggle that I brought you through. Don't forget when I kept you, when the enemy had surrounded you and everybody else had forsaken you. Don't forget, weep not, church. Weep not, but behold and refocus on the lion of Judah. Hallelujah, Jesus. He says this to Philadelphia, Pastor Matt. Behold, I open a door that no man can shut it. Hallelujah. No man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, but thou hast kept my word and has not denied my name. Hallelujah. He's saying, church, I'm opening a fresh door for you. And he's saying, look, before this happens, 
I have to address some things in the church house and individual believers so they get it right so they stand the test of time which is to come. You are in a preparation process. You are in the incubator, just like my baby is. And we are being prepared for what is to come. Because when we are, look, these are little trials. But what he's talking about is great. And I want to be one to stand when they happen. Get ready, he's saying. He said, you are in a process of learning how to possess and occupy the inheritance that was given to you on Calvary. And he saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who was worthy to open the book and loose the seals. Worthy meant morally fit. And none of us, none of us is morally fit. But God said, I sent my son to die for you, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of this world, that I would make you worthy. He's the one that is only worthy. And that resurrection life, when he rose from the grave, it said, God said, I accept this sacrifice. I accept the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, and I will raise him from the dead as a lion of Judah. And I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And I will give you victory and cause you to triumph over everything that comes your way. And it says that no man in heaven nor on earth nor under the earth was able to open the book and neither to look thereon. And I wept because there was none found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither to look in the book. But this upcoming judgment that is in this book, I want to say this, God is just, he is judge. But the whole point was to return his people back to him. Even in the great tribulation, it will be to return the Jews and his people back Reason and he said, My 
desire my people to weep not any longer, but to behold and refocus and reset again the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, to lay hold of their inheritance and possess the kingdom of God. I pray that this morning we will then leave here without allowing God and getting things right with him. Even if we just need to tell him we love him. Oh, refocus our vision. Refocus our vision, oh God. God, that we would behold you, oh God, and we wouldn't be consumed by the pressure and the temptation, oh God, of the enemy, oh God, or be overwhelmed by Beauty.